We'll look at the error of lordship salvation. The sad fact is that from time to time doctrines become popular while others fall out of favor. What's all that about? Is it in the Bible or is it not, you see? Of course, Bible doctrines should be steadfast, not whether we find them uh, popular or a lot of people talking about it, but whether we find them in the Word of God. So recent times, and I, I believe that the real focus here is on Reformed theology, has promoted an error of the gospel. <clears throat> and I call it, and it has been called, Lordship Salvation. Now, I understand and appreciate the reason for its popularity. I believe that it seems, this concept seems to make the gospel tougher, um, guarantees that those who are making the decision for salvation will live godly lives, take it seriously. See? Reformed theology brings the church under the law of Israel. <clears throat> Open Door Baptist subscribes to dispensational theology, the other side of Reformed theology, which holds to the literal interpretation of the Bible. We don't just say what the Bible says is so, we actually practice that. So, it is our duty to point out the error of lordship salvation. Um, I think when I first heard this, I thought, yeah, that's what we need. This is, we need to get tougher on this. We need to lay it out at the beginning. But what I came to realize is that, first of all, this is the danger of another gospel. The danger of another gospel. Those who preach Lordship Salvation decry the so-called easy believism of gospel preaching. They claim that such preaching creates church members who fall easily into sin. We should, they tell us, preach a salvation that believes in Christ and living a godly life. We're just bringing something in to the gospel. You see? We should not separate law and grace. They urge us to alter the message of the gospel to make it harder. Now, this may seem like I'm putting words in their mouth, but um, uh, California pastor John MacArthur has the Grace to You radio program, and I am convinced that he's a big advocate of lordship salvation. Now, when asked about it, he said no, but here are his words, and I quote. In one sermon, he said, the message, the modern message of cheap grace, as it's often called, just believe in Jesus, that's all you need to do. The modern message that's often called easy believism, in fact, invites such shallowness and is at one 180 degrees from the message of John the Baptist. Do you see that he is saying that the message, the gospel message of just believe in Jesus is not enough. You see that? There was nothing about John's message that was easy. There was nothing about John's message that was warm and fuzzy. It was harsh. It was strong. It was confrontational. It was devastating because John understood how prone the sinner is to a shallow, superficial repentance that does not save. And this message was called True Repentance, God's Highway to the Heart, Part 1. All right, this is disturbing. Uh, this is a man of such education. Uh, I, I try to pick up, it's too expensive for me to buy new, so I try to pick up his uh, commentaries uh, uh, secondhand and so on, because they, they go into a great bit of detail. But it's disturbing that, such, that a man of such education should put forth the preaching of John the Baptist as the true gospel. What? John did not preach the gospel of salvation. I hope you're, you're deep enough in the word of God to understand that. 
He wasn't opposed to it. He just didn't preach it. In John's day, Christ had neither died for our sins nor risen from the grave. See? His message, John's message, was the message of repentance. That is, change your mind. Uh, stop sinning. See? People would come to him and say, well, we understand we're sinners, and we need to change. What should we do? See? And he'd give advice based on what your job was and so on. How to, how to change that up. But he came to do what? To prepare for the Christ, for the Messiah. He came to prepare for the message of salvation. It was preparation for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Such confusion of the gospel is inexcusable. Now listen to Paul's severe warning in Galatians 1.8. But though we, Paul says, we apostles, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. It's not a warm and fuzzy message, is it? But he says, what you have is the truth. Anything other than that, let that person be accursed. All right, well, what about this problem of sinful or slothful Christians? Well, let's clarify this. It does not depend on the kind of gospel preached. There's only one gospel. It actually depends on the training of the believer after salvation. See that? Faith is the fundamental requirement for salvation. Mockingly, he said, well, they're, they're only preaching believe in Jesus. <laughs> That's it. Faith is the fundamental requirement for salvation. Acts 16, 30, 31. The uh, Philippian jailer brought them out, said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, well, after you start living a godly life for a while, then you can believe in Jesus. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Warm and soft, fuzzy message there, I guess. And thou shalt be saved in thy house. Can I ask a question? Okay. What were they supposed to do during that time so that they did find Jesus? Yeah. What were they do there? How can they use God be like that? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Um, this is uh, it, ramping yourself up to faith. Hebrews 11.6 But without faith, and just faith, it is impossible to please him. It's not faith in anything. It's just faith. Impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now let me say it as plainly as I can. There is no salvation apart from faith. We're not going to look askance at preaching salvation by faith. There is no salvation apart from it. No salvation by living a godly, dedicating yourself to self-sacrifice. That's not the path of salvation. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that, just one word, believeth not, shall be damned, cursed. John 3, 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, believeth not. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Do you see it all hinges on belief? John 3.36, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, believeth. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. It is the matter of belief. Now, one of the things that has come from this is another error in teaching, and this was a little harder to catch. So let me just say it outwardly, as Roman numeral two, Christians do not automatically become disciples. Being a disciple is a, a, an intensive work. Part of the difficulty is that Lordship Salvation people use verses that deal with discipleship and they interpret them as salvation instructions. 
This is because Lordship Salvation teaches that a real Christian is a disciple, just equal sign. This would mean that whenever Jesus spoke of disciples, he was referring to all Christians. This is wrong. Judas was a disciple, but he was not even a believer. And so that was a, a position that he held, you see. And there were many believers who were not, at least not yet, disciples. So let me show you this. Uh, several verses could be used, but let me just give you this example. Acts 14, 21. This is talking about the missionary journeys. And when they had preached the gospel to that city. Preached the gospel is, is the Greek word euangelion, evangelize. When they had evangelized that city, preached the gospel, and had, secondly, taught, which is the word to disciple, many. So they preached the gospel, and they did something else. What? They discipled many. They returned again to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch. You see, the twofold work. One is you try to get the people saved, and then you try to, to, to urge them to a dedication to become a disciple. So, in this, we see Paul and his evangelistic team evangelized and discipled as separate activities. Now, they were linked, obviously, but there was one and then the other. Now, I want to take you to the teaching of Jesus here. When Jesus spoke to the multitude of his believers, now I'm, gra I'm granting you that not everybody that, that came, that flocked in, came because they were believers, but many of them were believers. Maybe they came because they wanted to heal, and wanted healing, or they wanted the free food, or whatever was going on. <clears throat> but... Many of them came because they liked what they heard and they were believing that he was the Messiah. But now I want you to realize that he urged them to take the next step to become disciples. Luke 14, 26, 27. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Do you see these are steps of dedication. This is, uh, this is learning how to focus on Christ more than all these other things. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. He is saying, now that you believe, I want you to put God first, Christ first, my message first, and then you will become a disciple. Luke 14, 33, same basic passage. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. I, I hope you understand that when people first get saved, they do not automatically seek to forsake all that they have. It is after you get saved that you begin to see the value of salvation, the value of life in Christ, and the relative lack of value of, of everything else. And so then we forsake all that we have. We're, we're not claiming it as our own. We're saying this has been a gift of God. And in this, you become a dedicated disciple. So what was he doing here? He was asking them to take the further step to become disciples. Now, he even emphasized this to the twelve who were called his disciples because they actually started walking with him, traveling everywhere with him, listening to all the words. But look at this extensive passage here, but Matthew 10, 33 to 39. He says this, But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I, am not come to, uh, for I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be that of his own household. He says the Christian life is going to lead to some tough times where you're going to have to make some choices. Now, with that in mind, 
now that you're believers. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You see the distinctions they had to make? And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. And he that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses, loseth his life for my sake shall find it. So the Christian life is going to be tough. I am urging you to be a dedicated disciple and focus on the right things. So, Lordship Salvation tries to confuse dedicated discipleship with becoming a Christian. But you cannot take the step of discipleship until you are a Christian. So I want you to understand the distinction between salvation and discipleship. And to do that, let me give you two points. Number three, salvation is absolutely free. Now, if in your heart you don't agree with this, you've got to go back to Scripture. It's just free. Romans 3.20 Therefore, by the deeds of the law, doing good deeds, things that God has urged, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, because that's not the purpose of the law. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law shows that you're a sinner. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. That's not how you get justified. William R. Newell, son of a preacher who was a renegade and lived his own life and then got saved. And he, he's very clear on this, this matter. He said, now it is apparent that to bring men off from their false hopes in their law obedience... I hope I'll be uh, a, a, a good Christian because I've kept the law. Three things must become evident to them. A, that law, having been broken, can only condemn. By law is the knowledge of sin. B, that even were men enabled now to begin keeping perfectly any law of God, they could not make up for past obedience or remove present guilt. What if... <laughs> You know, what, what if you kept borrowing money from me, <laughs> as though I had money to give, and then say, well, pastor, I've, I've come under conviction. I see it's wrong to keep borrowing money, so from now on, I'm not going to borrow money, so we call it even. So, well, well, wait a minute. It doesn't uh, take care of uh, past problems or present debt, you see. And then see that keeping law is not God's way of salvation. Or of blessing. And that's what Lordship Salvation is promising. Look again, Romans 4, 6. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Does this not cut the Lordship Salvation off at the ankles? Or higher? Charles Hodge who himself was Reformed theology, says, to whom God imputeth righteousness without works, that is, whom God regards and treats as righteous, although he is not in himself righteous. You see what Lordship Salvation is saying? Get righteous as you get saved. And he says, no, this is saying that he imputes the righteousness while you're not righteous. The meaning of this clause, he says, cannot be mistaken. And then, of course, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now take, take your average Christian, believes in Christ, gets saved. He says, I couldn't have done it myself. Lordship Salvation guy says, yeah, I'm a better Christian because I got saved under Lordship Salvation. See, So what is he doing? He's boasting. Disqualified. <laughs> Matthew Poole says, not of works, any works whatever, and not only the works of the ceremonial law. So this ramping up to be godly. See? 
Salvation is absolutely free. But then, on the other side, Roman number four, discipleship is costly. One is free, one is costly. That's why there's two separate things here. We see this in the verses above, that discipleship is costly. Receiving salvation comes by receiving the gospel, while discipleship comes by dying daily to self. Let me share with you five things about discipleship. A, discipleship demands self-denial and cross-bearing. None of this you have to do before you get saved. Matthew 16, 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Discipleship demands loving Christ above family. Luke 14, 26, If any man come to me and hate not his father, mother, wife, children, brethren, yet in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Disciple again. Discipleship demands forsaking earthly possessions. So likewise, whosoever be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Fourth, discipleship demands steadfastness. Discipleship does that. See? Christians can fall. Christians can fail. Christians can fall into the pit of despair. But a disciple is steadfast. John 8, 31. Then saith Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If, these are the believers, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Two steps. And then E, discipleship demands fruitfulness. Christian automatically doesn't necessarily have to be fruitful or show himself fruitful before he gets saved. John 15, 8, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. So, conclusion. Boy, I'm done early. <clears throat> Salvation comes by faith alone, while discipleship comes by works. This is the mistake that Lordship Salvation makes. And let me give you Romans 4, 2 through 5. I want you to think through Paul's argument here. Going back to the Old Testament. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, to boast. But not before God. For what saith the scripture? He says it wasn't that Abraham was so good that God uh, counted it for righteousness. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So he says, as a result of this, we believe. Now to him that worketh is the reward reckoned not of grace, but of debt. If I could do the good works so that God would save me, that would be God's debt to me. Grace means a gift. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. I don't see how it could be any, any clearer. So, we can get all up in arms of too many slothful Christians. Well, I'll tell you why. It's because most churches are not preaching the word of God. They're not giving the Christians the stuff to grow on. All they're doing is counting the numbers and saying, look how many came to Christ, see? So, it's the discipleship that needs to be done to get people in steadfast position of salvation. Now, I hope that clarifies it for you. <clears throat> I had to work through that. Uh, great old preacher Ketchum uh, pointed this out. Salvation is free. Discipleship is costly. I said, well, of course. I knew that. And uh, that, that uh, should clarify it for us, I think. Let's bow for prayer. Our Father, you have given us the opportunity to look in some depth at this 
seemingly uh, well-intentioned doctrine of lordship salvation. And yet it fails. It fails because any time we make salvation more complicated than faith alone, we are preaching another gospel. I ask that you might so change in us the attitude that we become eager after salvation <clears throat> to become a disciple, to recognize that discipleship means we're letting all the things of the world drop off as important to us and putting the things of God as first place. We are seeking first the kingdom of God and all these other things can be added unto us. Now I ask that you might guide and direct each one of us to realize that once we are a Christian, then we ought to desire to grow. We ought to desire to become a steadfast, fruit-bearing, uh, self-sacrificing disciple, learning how to step, step by step, into the steps of Christ. With heads bowed, eyes closed, it may be that you're saying, I am saved, but I've taken the easier path and I haven't become a disciple. I haven't dedicated myself to reading and studying the Word of God. I haven't given myself to a time of prayer. I haven't given myself to the understanding of the doctrines of the Word of God. I haven't, haven't applied myself in that area. I need to become a disciple now that I'm saved. If that's your prayer, I wonder if you'd just slip your hand up and say, pray for me. This is where I need to go. Yes, amen. Amen. Father, then we commit this time to you. We thank you for that you are not ready just to let us be a newborn child and leave us at that, but you take us as a newborn and want us to grow, to mature, to come to that place of maturity where we know we're not deceived by every wind of doctrine. Guide and direct us then, Father, as we seek to listen carefully, to follow you, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.